Acts 2, verses 41 to the end of the chapter, just a few verses. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, we come together every Sunday morning. I'm glad of that, otherwise I'd be here on my own. So thank you for coming this Sunday. Um, at other times we come together and in other places, Christians meet together. To do what? Well, let's go back to Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. God's word, calling upon his people to come together in worship. So these early Christians, having been freshly anointed with the gift of God's spirit, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, remember that they were uh, Jews, these people who were converted. They already had an understanding and a knowledge of the Old Testament, but it needed to be reprogrammed. They needed to understand it differently, just as Jesus, after his resurrection, reprogrammed the understanding of those on the road to Emmaus, and, the, and, and then later on that day, as he explained to them from the scriptures that the Messiah had to suffer and die. So they were devoted. They couldn't get enough of it. They were hungry to know, well, what did go? How did we misunderstand that? Let's, they were hungry for what God was saying through his word. They were devoted to it. Uh, they were devoted to fellowship with God and with each other. And we looked at that uh, last uh, Sunday. So we come together on a Sunday morning, of course, to worship God. So you could then ask the question, well, okay, so what is worship? What are its ingredients? What's in the mix? How can it be properly expressed? What is it that God is looking for when God's people coming together to worship? What can we take then from the example of the early church here in Acts chapter 2? So I'm just going to throw out a, a few uh, thoughts that I see here. Uh, in the scriptures. First of all, um, I'm thinking, well, their worship was both, well, it was a mix of both formal and informal. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Remember, these were Jews, and they, they weren't rejecting everything about being a Jew, and there were set times of worship and of prayer in the temple in Jerusalem every day. It would have been quite uh, liturgical. It would have had a set reading for the day from the Old Testament. Every day they participated in the quite formal worship, if you like, of the temple. But they also met together in their homes, which gives me the feeling that this worship of God's people was this mix of the, the formal, if you like, state occasion, the worship of God in the temple, with all its rituals and all its sacrifices and everything that went with that. But they also met together in their homes. So they worship, if you like, it was both regular and spontaneous. It was both, to use a long word, liturgical and charismatic. There was this combination of both in the worship of those who had so wonderfully recently discovered the, the, the faith that was being proclaimed by Peter in his sermon at Pentecost. And of course, for ourselves all these centuries later, our upbringing, our personality, and our experience, all of that will affect how best you and I worship. Some like it loud. 
um, is uh, when we go to visit our family, they go to a particular church. And the last time I was there before we left Will, uh, not only did I pack my pajamas and my toilet bag and everything else that you'd need, I made sure that in my toilet bag was a set of earplugs. Because I thought, come, we go to worship, I'm going to need those earplugs because I mean, it's not for me when it's so loud. I mean, I, I can sing quite loudly, but when you're in a congregation and you're singing as loud as you can, you haven't got a clue whether you're on your tune or not because you can't hear yourself singing, that to me is too loud. Yeah, so I'm not in for the very uh, uh, loud, but some like it loud. God bless them. And may God be blessed in the loudness. That's how they like it. Some like it quiet. And I suppose the, uh, the, the tradition where that's exemplified is in, the, <laughs> is in the Quaker tradition. You can't go and play guitar in the Quaker tradition or your banjo or anything else. No. Some like it quiet, just completely still. And there are moments when, you know, me personally, I like it quiet. Yeah. And again, that's just the mix of temperament and of personality. Um, some like it long. You know, you, you read about folk going to, say, church in Africa somewhere, and they've walked to church in the heat for an hour and a half. Well, they're going to feel short-changed if they don't have a long service because they've got another hour and a half to walk back home. So having walked an hour and a half, they want a long time together in worship and in fellowship. They're going to make the most of it. Three hours, nah, four, five hours before they, they get home. Core, try that year, eh? Our service next Sunday morning will be five hours long. Ooh, there you are, you've got the reaction. Some like it long, some like it short. Again, it's dependent, isn't it, upon culture and circumstances, and those can be different. Some like worship to be quite led, I suppose, liturgical. Some prefer a bit of a free-for-all. Um, some like to be still, and some like to dance. Now, I'm not in that category. I've got two left feet. And so when it comes to dancing, you know, count, count me out. I don't do um, dancing. But I have seen dance performed in worship that has been quite so beautiful and graceful. Um, and you thought, yeah, well, I, I can't do it. <laughs> Others can. Again, it's according to a gift. In the, some like to raise their hands in praise. Others prefer to keep their hands firmly by their side. And I've always said, look, if, you know, if you're next to someone who's raising their hands, don't think, oh, there they go raising their hands. And if you're raising your hands and somebody else next to you isn't raising their hands, don't go. It's, it's a personal choice. As long as the worship is in spirit and truth, God doesn't really care whether you raise hands or you don't raise hands. God doesn't really care if it's loud or it's quiet, whether it's long or it's short. I think that, you know, if I can take the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 that we'll, sometimes you'll, you'll hear read on various occasions. It says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And you apply that to how worship takes place amongst God's people across nations and cultures. And there's huge, God loves variety. I don't think scientists have yet found two snowflakes that are exactly alike. Imagine all the snowflakes. You can't imagine all the snowflakes in the world. But every one that's been looked at is different from any other one that's been looked at. If there are two the same, they haven't been found or they've melted. God loves variety. And he's quite chilled about variety of worship. We will have our choices. We will have our preferences but here i just notice in the early church there seems to have been a mix of how they came to worship god it was in the temple courts where it would have been formal and led liturgical for a set time and it was in their homes and i can imagine that being a bit more of a free for all they worship god in those ways secondly I see that their worship was, was both um, joyful and reverent. Luke tells us that they were together with glad and sincere hearts. The last few uh, words there in Acts 2 and verse 46. And that word glad there that Luke uses, it's a 
very glad word. It's an exulting word. It's an emotionally charged word. The message translation talks about exuberant joyfulness. Get the picture? Yeah, exuberant. I can start dancing at this point. Exuberant joyfulness. Um, I remember uh, years ago, I, I had a congregation in front of me. Now, I'm a bit of a Star Trek fan. And if you know Star Trek, then you know that um, uh, all about Vulcans, that uh, race of people who like uh, logic and they try to suppress all emotion. And I remember thinking to myself in front of this congregation, crumbs, I've got a congregation full of Vulcans in front of me, because they were all... I thought, anybody at home? Is there any life in there? Is there any rejoicing that God is good and great and that he saved you? Exuberant joy. I, I remember quoting the old hymn because I know they liked the old hymn. Him serve with mirth, the old hymn says. His, his glories foretell. Can't you be mirthified? <laughs> I was getting a bit hot under the collar. Be full of mirth, joyfulness. At least I'm really smiling, yeah. Gladness. Called to come before God with a sense of joy in their hearts, their worship was a joyful celebration of all that God was and all that they discovered that God had done through them, through Jesus. And as uh, one writer has put it, while in our worship we may remain dignified, surely it is unforgivable to be dull. But that exuberant joyfulness should never become flippant. This, this, this is balance, isn't it? It should be a, a joy that's also reverent. And I want to suggest to you a slightly different translation of the verses before us, which the Greek allows, and I think actually makes more sense of what Luke was trying to say. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. Most translations talk about the awe being linked with the apostles performing signs and wonders. But it can equally be referring to what Paul, uh, Luke has just described as their, their worship. And I think that actually fits just as well. In fact, the word that, Paul, uh, that Luke uses there, filled with awe, is the Greek word um, phobos. So actually, he says, and fear came upon them. You know, we've got the word phobia in, in English, haven't we? Acrophobia, fear of an open space, and acrophobia, fear of spiders, claustrophobia. So that's the word, and that's the word Paul, uh, Luke uses here. He says great phobia came across, not in the sense of terror, but in the sense of respect and awe, I think is the good translation. There was a sense of awe in this exuberant, joyful worship. Their joy was never irreverent. But their reverence was never joyless. And somehow we need to keep those two together. I think of sometimes of our worship as being the, the shop window of the church. Right? You know, the doors open there. What have people thought is going on as they've walked by? We've got in mind another outdoor service, uh, the weather permitting, um, coming up. It tells people, does it not, what we think of God. Our worship betrays just how great we think he is. Our worship reveals whether or not we think that God is worth getting excited about. Our worship shows whether or not we have in some ways encountered his holiness, which will bring that sense of awe into the joyfulness. You see, worship is a, a colorful spectrum which creates, I think, its own moods. And it's right that perhaps some Sundays we're over the top joyful. It's right perhaps on another Sunday that it's quieter and more restrained and reflective. That's all right. That's good. Whether the mood of worship is living, vibrant, whether it's loud, whether it's still. Think of worship as a, 
part of the journey of exploration as humanity and God meet. It's a journey initiated by God as he seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship is when the creature reaches up and touches the creator, when the Savior meets the sinner and the sinner meets the Savior. In worship, we are called upon with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength to connect with the one true God, the triune God, in whose image we were created, in whose image we are being reformed and recreated. Because in this worship, we fellowship with God. And within God, there is worship. The Father adores the Son. The Son adores the Father, both in the power of the Spirit. So when we worship, we are actually being invited into and caught up into God, into the fellowship of the Father and the Son. You know, sometimes I feel, oh, what's this God about? Is he some sort of ego maniac that demands to be worshipped? No, he's inviting us to experience what he already experiences as Father, Son, and Spirit. He is the worshipping God in that sense. In ways it's difficult sometimes to get our heads around. But he's inviting us into fellowship with himself so that with the Son we cry out, Abba, Father, in worship. The following uh, list that you're going to see on the screen is, is sort of my attempt, based on something else I read years ago, to understand something of the spectrum of worship. In worship, we are called upon to humble ourselves before the greatness of God. In worship, we are called to cleanse our hearts by the grace of God. In worship, to feed our minds with the truth of God. To excite our imaginations by the sheer beauty of God. To open our hearts to the love of God. To surrender our wills to the purposes of God. And to strengthen ourselves in the power of God. You don't always get it right. As someone who leads people in worship, I sometimes have to remind myself of those bullet points. What am I seeking to achieve by crafting together an order of service? Final point to remind ourselves is that Jesus was at the center of it all. Luke tells us that they met together and they broke bread together, which was a semi-technical term for what we now call communion. And communion is just another word which means fellowship. Of course, that may well have been part of a larger meal together that the, the, the disciples shared, especially as they were meeting together in each other's homes. But don't forget that the bit that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, when he shared the bread and he shared the, the, the cup, that was only a small part of the much larger Passover meal. But it was a bit that then became infused with that sense of worship. Do this in remembrance of. And Luke, of course, is putting it in this list of things which are clearly elements of worship. The apostles' teaching to which they were devoted, the fellowship to which they were devoted, the prayers to which they were devoted. Is it in that list? It was the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus that was at the heart of their worship. And it must always be at the heart of our worship. We must be Jesus focused. And whatever our personal preferences in terms of the style of worship might be, how we worship must always be, you must always remember it is a secondary issue. Who we worship. That's what matters. And God can find those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Who are following a traditional Baptist order of service. Like a hymn sandwich singing hymns from the old Baptist hymn book. And if people are worshipping in spirit and in truth. Then God is blessed. And God can look upon the most contemporary worship service that you can possibly have. And he doesn't find anybody worshipping in spirit and truth. Or vice versa. 
And I know I have been guilty in the past of allowing secondary issues to assume most important status. We must always keep the who we worship at the fore. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus had that conversation with the woman of Samaria. She said to him, this is in John 4, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. In other words, she's saying, where we worship is the most important thing to God. You say there and we say here. doesn't say this, but I can imagine Jesus saying, oh, for goodness sake. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. In other words, he's saying to her, where doesn't matter. Who matters in spirit and in truth? Back in the 1990s, not the 1980s, Matt Redman, not Graham Kendrick, Matt Redman wrote a song called The Heart of Worship, which we'll be singing pretty soon. And that song has a story behind it. At the church where he was a prominent uh, musician and worship leader, they realized that their worship had become almost an end in and of itself. With people saying, what did I get out of worship today, rather than what did I put into worship today? And who's worship for? For what we get out of it or for what God gets out of it? Come on. He realized that they were consumers of worship, and I'm quoting here, consumers of worship rather than producers of worship. You see the difference? And Matt Redman wrote the words of this song as an act of confession. And his church sang it in a spirit of humble repentance as well. And the song went viral as it struck a chord, pun intended, with worshipping congregations around the world. When the music fades and all is swept away, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. <laughs>